Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On today's episode, we have a special guest. He went to a prep school in Maine called MCI for his senior year of high school before playing four years at Purdue University and then 14 years in the NBA to include two stints in the All-Star game, both as a member of the East team and the West team. And just another little fact, he is my first cousin and the person I've known probably the longest in my life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to welcome Brad Miller to the podcast. Brad, welcome. Welcome, Cuz. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, obviously, I know all, all your history, um, but you, your mom and my dad are siblings, and you're about six months older than I am, so you and I grew up uh, going to camps together and, and everything, and so I've seen you through your whole process. Um, obviously, I know why I picked basketball. Why did you pick basketball as your main sport growing up? I loved it. You know, I mean, it's kind of our family at that point, that was the sport the whole family played, you know, between your dad and our other uncles, you know, playing basketball is kind of, you know, when the family gene goes seven foot, six, 11, six, nine, and you're next up, you're kind of like, all right, I bet there's going to be a height group at some point here. You know, I was on five eleven as a freshman, about a buck 60, it seemed like as a freshman in high school. So, but I mean, I just love basketball. He said we went to camps going down to, Stanford University way back in the day. I mean, just some off the off the chart stuff. But uh, you know, I loved it. Um uh, able to talk my mom and get the little concrete in the backyard. And that's between that and the park uh, is where I spent a lot of time. Now, what moment, either in junior high or high school, did you know you were good? Probably sophomore year finally when I started dunking the ball, like on a regular basis, where it's like no one in the history of my high school, which is kind of like Hoosiers, basically. Like the town would shut down on Friday, Saturday nights for a home game and road games. They would travel and get there three, four hours before the game and raise them heck, you know, out there pre gaming and, you know, started dunking the ball. And then it just kind of that camp year between sophomore and junior, I really grew even more. I mean, I was 5'11, then I was 6'5, then I was 6'9, then like right at 6'11. That was my high school years are gross. So that growth spurt, obviously I didn't have no weight to it, but you know, I was always playing guard. So just now I was a taller guard ish that, you know, playing big guy moves, but you know, I just was, went to a camp at uh tri-state, which is trying. And then in goal, Indiana, and that summer, I came back, told my mom, like, was after freshman, you know, like you got to send me somewhere else. I want every award. It was like free throw, one-on-one, -on -one, three, three on three, five on five skills. I was like, I got to go somewhere else. Like this isn't, this isn't enough competition for me. So that's going into sophomore year, really jumped and elevated the idea of, you know, start that family focus of getting a division one scholarship is the goal or getting a basketball scholarship for college was the family goal. So that's when it really started kicking like, okay, I think this is going to work out, you know, somewhere. Yeah. Um, you ended up transferring your senior year to a prep school and you ended up going to Maine Central Institute, which was a powerhouse in New England. And I know there were some connections between, uh, you know, some people we knew and the coach up there, Max Good. And you've told me this many times, that was a night and day difference when you showed up to the first practice there. Tell me a little bit about the biggest difference between the practices at your high school versus at MCI and, and, and not just practices, but basketball in general. Like what was the big differences and what made it so much better? Well, I mean, the, the skill level, we had ended up having, I think, seven or eight Division One players on my team that, that year. Um, obviously, I had Chad Austin, who I went to Purdue with. So there was two Purdue guys. Uh, Luther Clay ended up coming to Purdue at one point for a little bit. Um, we had a guy, Kevin Norris, played down at Miami University. Um, Antoine Hubbard played out west somewhere. And one of our best players that would have been a stud D1 player got in trouble. And had to leave the team but I mean we had seven legit division one players on the team so you know I stepped in from being the biggest guy at practice and then obviously coach good was more of a 
he liked to have those 6 a.m. practices sometimes. So that was a little different than high school was just come in and shoot free throws before school. It wasn't full on practice, but it was a lot of, uh, a lot of discipline. I mean, a lot of people went there just didn't have, lacked a lot of structure, you know, and discipline on the court, off the court, you know, Max really made you grow up real quick because you were in situations with, I'm from Kinderville, Indiana, and the next day I'm playing with guys from South Boston, you know, New York City, I mean, the whole East Coast, Philly, a guy from downtown Pittsburgh, a 6'9 black guy with a lazy eye, so that was a little intimidating for me. <laughs> the first day out there, like, oh, my goodness. But, uh, you know, I just I, I knew how to play basketball, so that makes the transition a lot easier. Coach Good's famous in New England circles. And, and for those that don't know, Max Good coached at Eastern Kentucky University, coached for a while at MC App in Maine, which at the time was one of the most dominant prep school programs in the country, and then went to become coach at Loyola Marymount and then UNOV at one point too. So um, tell tell us what makes Max different as a coach, like especially you being a 17-year-old kid. Like <laughs> what, what was the difference maker that he had that maybe other coaches in your life hadn't had before that? He's, he's the one coach I could call right now. Obviously, we couldn't have him on a podcast because his language is not <laughs> not, a, not appropriate. But, you know, just, uh, you know, this guy picked me up. I had no clue who he was. Picked me up at the airport in Bangor, Maine. He's like, do you want any McDonald's or something? I was like, sure. And I was like, all right. As soon as we get there, it was like, we got practice. I was like, man, we just, just showed up. And it's like they're down there running. I mean, we used to run. 17 in a minute side side nine the sideline so i got to college you're like oh you're a big guy you only got to run 15 i was like man this is a cakewalk because you know he treated everybody you had to run i mean that was the one thing he was going to get your get you in shape and that was one of his biggest ways of discipline was like respecting you got to be in shape to be able to play this game i mean we pressed 38, 39 minutes out of 40. It didn't matter if we were up 50. He'd still be like, press, press, press. And just, you know, he taught a way to destroy. He wanted you to destroy the team too, you know. And I think we lost the most games that year and forever. It was like six or seven games was the most he'd lost in the season. But they had another prep school that year, Winston, that just started. And they ended up having like nine Division One players, two NBA players on the team. So they were pretty – pretty stacked as it turns out of course we played like six times so I think we went three and three against them maybe or two and four they were they were a tough team but he, he taught a lot of discipline and I mean you're out there on your own in Maine I mean there was a bus came through once a week seemed like you know you couldn't even get out on a bus or a train if you wanted to so you're just kind of stuck up there but you had to learn you know survival up there yeah did you get homesick Oh yeah, big time. I mean, got to go home for Christmas time, and then the fam sent me back on a train with, with a big old trunk and a suitcase to Boston about twelve thirty on New Year's Eve. That was always fun trying to go through three million people to get back to a random guy that I met from prep school is going to meet me in New Hampshire, <laughs> pick me up at the last train stop. So, you know, it, it was definitely you know taught some tough life lessons, made you grow up. That was for sure. It was, a lot quicker in certain ways and, you know, makes you another way in other ways. Now, when you got to Purdue your freshman year, you were co-freshman of the year in the Big Ten. Would that have happened without prep school? I doubt it. I mean, um, like I say, the amount of work that we did at prep school, there was no papers. There was no internet back then. You know, we didn't have a local much covering us. So Coach Good just got to coach – and, you know, as hard as he wanted, you know, I grew up with the Bobby Knight era, call it that, you know, discipline and, you know, that type of coaching didn't bother me. That's what I was kind of used to, you know, growing up in Indiana. So, I mean, he'd go many times. He's like, I'll take these two guys from Indiana over all you talented bleep, bleep, bleeps and wherever, because they know how to play the game of basketball. So that made it a little bit easier, at least that my basketball IQ was really good from where I came from. And that really helped me get through prep school but the competition level I mean I want to play against maybe one division division one player in my whole senior in high school I mean I would have been triple double dunking on people blocking you know I'm going to get six one guys instead of six nine athletic guys or six ten guys um, guys that are bigger guys that were stronger so I mean the competition level I had was 
insane that you're up at prep school and that that just kind of set it off like man Purdue seemed a little easier you know than being at prep school like competition I'd already played against this many got good guys before so you know it just set it up for a lot easier transition in terms of the competition level yeah and you picked Purdue but your final three schools were Purdue Oklahoma State and Providence uh, Eddie Sutton, Hall of Fame coach at Oklahoma State. Rick Barnes at Providence. Gene Cady at Purdue. Obviously, Purdue's in your home state, but what was the final – what was the one thing that pushed them overboard that made you choose that over the other two schools? Um, I'd literally say it was back in Indiana after being at prep school, being gone for a year. I mean, I'm still close with a lot of friends I grew up with. We have an insane high school group in my class um, that I didn't graduate with back home, but would have, you know we still have a lot of us that really keep in contact to this day. And so knowing I'd have a lot of support like that from friends and family. If I went on Providence, you know, after being on my own or Oklahoma State, I would have been on my own again. Like I was at prep school. And so it really, you know, my best friend was my roommate, my freshman year at Purdue. So I mean, had both had got called into coach Kitty's office a few times over the years, you know, like, what are you guys doing? But, you know, I, I had good friends and, really good support system that was going to be close to me is three hours away from home. I mean, now with the new roads, it's two hours, but you know, it took three hours to get there back in the day, but that was a lot closer than, you know, driving to Providence or Oklahoma state. Right. What's the main thing you learned from coach Katie? Just more discipline about the, you know, he was a military guy too. So it's kind of like, you know, but he ended up being a big softy, you know, like I say, after Max, like he was a softy, you know, because he had restrictions, you know, he had to be a lot nicer all the time. But, you know, I respect Coach Katie of, um, you know, structure of discipline. And if you did something wrong, you know, you're about to be on the bench and there's consequences. So he was real good about teaching consequences on and off the court, you know, cause and effect. And, you know, he's he loved um, loved his players. You know, growing up, he wanted to see him become a man. That's the big thing about Purdue's. They always want to develop you not as a player, but as a person, as a man. And they're doing that now with Painter there, too. I mean, they're really taking these young guys and just see them getting better and better as a person and better as a player every year. Gotcha. Fun question. What was the toughest place to play in the Big Ten? Oh, man. Well, it depends. The first year, at Penn State was tough because they had the old arena. Mm. So I'd literally take the ball out of bounds and the ref would have to push, like make a little pattern. So I'd have to like lean forward into the play and like throw a pass down the side. So that was kind of a little tough, you know, just because the fans were so on top of you and they got the new arena, so it wasn't as bad. Assembly Hall, I had people put uh, red, red laser pointers in my eye when I shoot in free throw. So that was always fun, you know, they're obviously – throwing crap at our bus the whole way for four years. We'd stay like 40 minutes outside of town just because our assistant coach said, we're not giving no money to that city at all. And so IU was always fun. Iowa was a tricky little booger to play. Uh, Iowa was the pink locker room with, you know, Dr. Tom Davis to make you relax a little bit. So Northwestern wasn't bad. Wisconsin was cold. Michigan State was loud. Yeah. But, you know, Mackey's the biggest, the hardest one to play in. I mean, sure. Well, your home we court. Only, yeah, we only, they still don't lose, don't lose at home, you know, and we only lost a handful, maybe five, six games at home in four years. Yeah. Now you guys had a great run where you guys were there. Um, all right. You finished your career at Purdue losing to Stanford in the Sweet 16. Tough battle. Yep. Still got yeah. a scar. I got the scars from that game. Still got the scar from the, the Collins twins and Mark Madsen. Um, and then you opted for the NBA draft and you went undrafted. Explain why you went undrafted, if you even know all these years later. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, <laughs> that is a question that um, puzzled me and puzzled my agent for years. But, you know, everything works works out for a reason. And, you know, if I would have got drafted, I wouldn't have been able to play in the world championships that year in 1998. Um, you know, it was about the lockout started July 1st, and I think July 10th, I got a call from USA Basketball. They were, had, to, had to put a team together because NBA guys couldn't play. And I had previously played three different summers for USA Basketball on different teams and events. That's something I really 
took a lot of pride in playing for our country. So that opportunity came about. Uh, Trajan Langdon and Earl Boykins were the only two other college guys and the rest were older guys that have been playing overseas. And one of them was Jimmy Oliver from Purdue. So it's kind of crazy to play with on a team now all of a sudden with an older Purdue guy out of nowhere, you know, it just kind of gets thrown together. And then when I was over there, I got a bunch of different offers from European teams. I could have went to Spain, you know, the division one top tier team, but I would have had to stay all year. And the team in Italy I chose was a division two, but they were going to let me out of my contract, which I didn't know how well, you know, I didn't complain. I was going to make 14 years in the NBA. So, you know, I want to go to a team where I could still keep my FIFA rights and everything still going but you know that opportunity wouldn't have been there to have the opportunity to play professional basketball before I got to the NBA even because of the lockout so in terms of draft position I got to go to Charlotte um, a couple of days after the draft before the lockout had a good workout pretty much had a verbal guarantee that they were going to at least give me a, a one-year deal at the time you know to get me back in the NBA so I was able to play professional and learn professional over in Italy, which was interesting. But, um, you know, came back to Charlotte, was in basketball shape, and was watching all these guys that I grew up with just struggling, couldn't even run up and down the court. Like, holy cow, you guys did nothing during the lockout. And so I like, just came in with, you know, basketball shape ready to go, and we're playing 50 games where we played three games in a row. So the old guys got to play early, and then by the third game, it was like, ooh, I feel good coaching, get like 25 minutes, you know, sometimes like that. And so my confidence was good. And from there, as I like had 32 and 16, my last game of rookie year, and the confidence just kind of went from there, you know? Yeah. And we talked about this in the past, but if you would have been drafted, you might not have had that chip on the shoulder. Like you not yeah. being drafted, being passed over by all these teams, that probably is what fueled you to have the career you had too because you wanted every night to show someone they made a mistake on you. Am I, am I correct on that? Oh, yeah. And especially yeah. I told my agent I would never play for Larry Brown or Philadelphia my entire career because he swore to my agent, swore to me they were going to take me, and they picked a guy named Casey Shaw that you'd have to Google search to find out who the heck this guy is. But uh, he played at Toledo and – I think he played in the NBA for the lockout year and overseas for a couple, and that was about it. So, yeah, that chip is a, you know, it's a big thing. You know, people get drafted early first round and get extra treatment, and then you're not drafted. You're not, you're treated like you're not drafted. They're going to play the first round pick. They're going to play the second round pick over you until you prove that you're better than them and earn, you, you know, you don't get nothing handed to you. You have to earn every minute, every time you got a chance to play. So, that probably works out well for my attitude of how I played too. So, you know, at the end of the day, it all worked out better than I could imagine. Yeah. Michael Ola Candy, was he the number one pick that year? Yeah, uh, the candy man. I've destroyed that guy many times. Every single time you probably just every, thought that, right? every, every single time. It was like, you know, I saw him at a Pete Newell big man camp going into senior year out in Hawaii. And it was like, that's basically like, this guy's going to be the number one pick. I'm like, He's long and throws up a hook shot, but that's about it. I go, you can't, no, I can't shoot. But he ended up being number one pick. And it's like, like he would have been undrafted when they do, <laughs> when they do the, the comparisons of how people's careers should have been, according, well, where they should have been drafted accordingly. And I think I ended up like six or seven. You know, it would have been in my draft class with Vince Carter, Antoine Jameson, you know, and Mike Bivy in there. And those guys, and I think I, Dirk Nowitzki was in my draft. Mm -hmm. I think he would have been number one originally. That's what they said. If going back now, but I, I go, I'll take top ten. Yeah, you know, I was looking at like should have been six. You know, according to how your careers went. Now, obviously, growing up, we had posters on our wall. You know, I had David Robinson posters up on mine. I know you're a big Dominique fan. Yeah, and you're in the NBA now, and you've got those guys in the league, and you're <laughs> lining up against them in games, like. Tell me which player the first time you, you went in the game and he was in there, did, did you feel a little bit starstruck? Well, I don't know about starstruck as much, but I know Alonzo Mourning blocked like my first five shots ever in the NBA. And I was like, at the free throw, I'm like, man, can't you just let a rookie get his first buck? And he was like, looked at me like, please, no, man. Like, just real deep. And I was, because <laughs> it was like, they were only playing me against Miami because they were big guys. And I was like, 
man, can I play against somebody besides Alonzo wanting to start my career? So it started off kind of slow in the NBA because I was only playing against him and he was blocking all my shots. So once I played against the Bulls, got like 21 games. I was like, okay, this is all right. I can do this now. Right. And I remember the first time I saw you play, you came to Denver and it was 1999. And the night before you played against Salt Lake and Carl Malone, I said, what was it like guarding Carl Malone? And you pulled your shirt up and had a black and yellow <laughs> bruise all over your ribs. And we both thought that was kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah. Until, until you had to go do it again and then go get Shaq. And Shaq was always, I ain't doing nothing the next day, coach. Like, you want me to play and guard him? I can give it to you today, but. I don't think I'm going to do good on a back-to-back because that guy just physically, I mean, Malone, I'm glad I only had to play a couple of years. I was probably the strongest dude, but I, mean, I had Anthony Mason on my back uh, helping out. And then once I got to Chicago, I had Charles Oakley. So I had two of the, the baddest enforcers that took no crap from nobody. And if you're on your team, they were with you. So that always made it a little more helpful to have some severe muscle behind my back. Absolutely. Um, Let's talk about the Shaq incident. So uh, just to let you know, I was sitting on my couch in Texas. It was a late game. I, I bought the NBA pass, which I haven't bought since, just to watch you play as much as possible. And I remember you had an altercation with Shaq after just a game of just fouls and violence and fouls and violence and eventually came to a head when you and Charles Oakley both hammered him. Actually, Charles hammered him more than you did. Um, yep. Tell me, uh, <laughs> so what then happens? Why don't you tell people that don't know what happened? What happened? Well, real quick to preface it, no one knew who you were outside of small circles until this uh, this 13 sec, 15, <laughs> whatever, 30 seconds happened. This 30 seconds changed your career and your Q score in the basketball world. So tell me, tell me about what happened with Shaq. Well, his free throw percentage was less than his field goal percentage. So, like I said, at Oakley and I'd be like, hack a shack. That's what everybody played back then. It was like hack a shack. So, you know, me being a young player, third year in the league, it's like, I got six fouls. I got Charles Oakley's got six. He's got my back. And so late in the game, Shaq goes up. We hammer him. Oakley actually hammers me, that hammer Shaq with the same like floating elbow. And next thing I know, I'm walking away and I see a, I don't feel nothing. I'm just like on my left ear. It's kind of go, I'm like, man, Oakley, you got me. And I just slightly turned my head and I didn't see it. And the big old fist came and just literally popped my ear just a little bit because I barely turned. By the time I turned like this, it was like Oakley and Ron Artest. And I can't forget I had Ron Artest, a little crazy butt on the team. They tackle Shaq and then the whole bench jumps on top of me and he's got me by a my jersey underneath the teammates pulling me by my legs next thing i know jersey rips i get pulled out of a tunnel and that's that you know and you know that kind of sparked a lot of things because they're like that made big national news of everything shaq who's fighting at this and you know i got suspended one game which was kind of stupid but i was actually sick so i felt good about it i was like i couldn't play anyways i was physically sick but um i don't know it, it kind of sparked um a different swagger in me too. It was like came back like, you know, Shaq was the biggest, baddest dude in the league at the time. I mean, as a big guy, there's nothing bigger than Shaq. And so it's just kind of people like, oh, he started messing with Shaq. Okay, you know, and then it became, I don't know, it just became a different confidence and people knew more about me after that situation. So, you know, my game was getting better at the time too. So I was constantly improving. It's on my third year in the league. So it just kind of, I don't know, but I know my life would have went different if he'd been one inch to the right and squarely hit me in the back of the head. I probably wouldn't be sitting here in the same spot right now. Would have been retired a long time ago. Yeah, you'd be doing <laughs> yeah. right now. Yeah, after my third year, it'd been about three years in the NBA and four years in a coma, maybe. Well, you mentioned Ron Artest, too. You had the privilege of being his teammate more than anyone else in the NBA. Tell me something that everyday people might not know about Ron Artest as a teammate and as a person. Oh, he's one of the best people I ever met in my life. He cares more for, cares more than anybody. This kid doesn't care about, never cared about money or fame. He just, he literally has two wires. I mean, he's got, there's mental stuff, but he literally has two wires that sometimes go, and I always say when they spark, 
that's what people think of Ron Artest, like an incident here, incident here. You know, I mean, he threw one of the first HD cameras ever down on the ground in New York. We lost to the Knicks, and I was right behind him. He just put a palm went. Whoa. And they're like, well, that would cost you $150,000. And I was like, whatever. But um, he'll give you a shirt. I've seen him do it. Give his shirt off his back in the cold to somebody. And then just be shirtless out in the cold. Be like, no big deal. Like, he has one of the biggest hearts. So, you know, I went and visit where he came from during uh, playoffs one year with New Jersey. We went to Queensbridge. I was like, am I good? He's like, you're with me. And I was like, all right. And it's starting to get dark. And they're like, go get him, Ron. Go get him, B. Miller. Like, like where are the, where's these sounds coming from? <laughs> you know, and it was like, like, we're good. We're together. Like, all right. You know, just to see the love that, you know, I go home to my hometown. And it's kind of like him. He goes home to the QB, which is a rough area, very rough area. But he's, you know, he's got that characteristic. So we're home and trying to remember who you are, where you came from is very important to us. Now he took you to Queensbridge. You going to take him to Kinderville? I don't know. <laughs> but he would come to Kinderville. We'll take him to the hunt lodge. We'll stay yeah, up there. There you go. There, that'd be good for the TV show. Yeah. All right. A couple more questions here. Um, you made the all star team twice. Did you ever even dream of that growing up, or did you just want to get to the NBA? I didn't even really dream of the NBA. It was just more, I guess, our family was like, go to college. You know, we didn't have anybody ever meet, you know, Uncle Tom. Our Uncle Tom got drafted, almost made the Pacers back in the day when it was like five rounds of draft. And your dad played overseas for a few years. But, you know, it, it, was, it was like college, college, you get to college. And then between sophomore and junior year, when I was like, oh, I can make the NBA now because I was playing against guys that were getting drafted. I'm like, I just kicked that guy's butt, you know. So the NBA dream really kicked in, I'd say like sophomore and junior year, that little gotcha. gap there. But the All-Star game, like, what made it special about you being on the East team is that was Jordan's last year. Like, I mean, we grew up with watching him as kids. Like, what was that oh, yeah. like being in the locker room with him and all the media attention he was getting? Oh, it was it was insane to see because it's like, you know, they're like, oh, you got to do this. You got to do this for All-Star week and media. And Jordan's like, uh-uh, I'll see you at the game. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, this dude can do what he wants. Like, and they're like, what are they going to say? But. I remember they were like, it's Jordan's last game in Atlanta. And they walked into the locker room. There's like 200 pairs of Jordan shoes in all different sizes. They're like, well, if you want to wear Jordans, you know, depending on your sponsor, here's as many. I was like, basically my Jordan collection came from that all-star game. I was like, Paul Tran, I'm like, can you send us back all those 16s and send them back up to me? Which he's like, okay. So, but it was really cool. It was just, I told Isaiah, like, you got to put me in the court with Jordan same time. He never did, but, you know, we still had the, the experience of saying it was Jordan's last All-Star game was my first. So that team photo will always be there, and it would be pretty dang cool. Well, then you do that year. Next year you go to Sacramento, and you make the Western All-Star Conference with Kobe, Shaq, Garnett, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Like, who knew you could become an All-Star in both conferences in back-to-back -back years? Yeah, it was just um, kind of crazy. I mean, the Pacers one was – completely unexpected we had the best record at the break so it was like Isaiah was the coach and Jermaine was an all-star and it was like oh they'll probably pick Reggie or something and then I remember Isaiah press say like, hey you you made the all-star team I was like BS you know I was like you crazy you talking you talking to someone else and he's like no man you're on all-star team reserve I'm like and literally it was like you know a couple hours later they announced him I was like holy cow like it was just it was just madness to think, you know, it was like friends come, like load up on the, the Pacers. We all had the team playing. It was like, man, this is nuts. And then that first introduction and, you know, just to get a bucket in the all-star game was pretty cool. And, you know, got to Sacramento and, you know, we were had the best record again at all-star break. And it was Peja and myself is usually the, the best team record always gets like two players usually. And it just, um, you know, that year in Sacramento with Rick Adelman was like, a dream for me like well Webb was out so I got to start right away because it's going to be Vladi and Webb are going to be the stars you know of the team the Kings have been running but with him being hurt I got to step in and man it just clicked like I got to pass the ball finally you know shoot do everything that I always want to do that you know pushed me outside the boundaries where it was like oh you're just a big guy that just clogs up the middle and all this and 
going to Sacramento really allowed me to show the basketball skills that I truly had that I've been doing my whole life. But it was always like, always play a role, you know. And Coach Katie started to, like, you do this and that. Like, he's like, you don't shoot jumpers, you're seven foot. Like, Coach, I can shoot threes better than Mike Robbins. I'm like, come on. So, but it was a amazing opportunity to go out there. And I, I mean, trust me, I wouldn't have even thought about two all-star games that was <laughs> – Beyond beyond more than I could ever, 14 years is more than I ever imagined in my career, too. Right. And now let's, let's talk about what you're doing current day, Country Boy Outdoors. It's a TV show you've had for at least five years in the Sportsman Channel. Mm -hmm. um, why a TV show? Why hunting? I just like the outdoors. Um, and hunting is one of those, like, it's a peaceful thing. There's a challenge to it. Um, you know, I enjoy hunting my own property back in Indiana where it's about managing the deer. I mean, the, the peacefulness of planting a food plot in the spring for something that you're going to try to hunt over in October, November, December, and, you know, trying to see which deer you want to shoot. You know, it's like about the management is really cool. And it's just the peacefulness. It's a different bond of uh, there's basketball camp teams, you know, teams where you always bond and then there's like deer camp you know, turkey camp, uh, access to your camp. And I love the camaraderie that goes along with it and the excitement of seeing everyone go out. And then if you have success, it's like party time, you know, it's like just to see that the smiles you can create with people and hunting is and a lot more people can hunt than just play professional sports. So it's been, uh, it's a great way to get out, travel. I mean, I've been across the world for basketball, I've been across the world for hunting. Uh, from Africa to Lithuania to New Zealand, you know, and everywhere in between, Mexico. Uh, decline. Sorry, phone call came in. Decline it. And then but, you know, October of last year, two years ago, you know, you helped me kill my first deer on your property, and that was a fun moment too. That's a uh, oh uh, yeah. I mean, that's to see the enjoyment. Now I'm not. You know, I didn't grow up hunting because the basketball kind of goes during hunting season a lot. So I think that maybe did something too, where it's like professional baseball players always hunt. Well, they get done right when deer season starts. So it's like, ugh. So just the excitement of having something to do in the fall still is like deer camp. You know, I start in Kentucky every year. I go down there in September, first deer hunt of the year, and, you know, hunt all the way up maybe through January with different states. Texas is a big place I go to. And it's a dream of mine to have property down there. But, you know, it's it's just a, it's a fun, different way of pace of being competitive. With There's always competitiveness and everything. Like, oh, I can shoot a bigger buck or this and that. So it has some things that are a lot of fun. But it's very enjoyable just being outside. I love nature. I love, I mean, if you put me on a quad ranger, I'll be a happy, happy guy all, all the time what's one animal that still eludes you oh just a big old big old buck from back home in indiana now i'm talking like an animal like is there an exotic animal you still want to there's not a whole lot there's not a whole lot of ones that i haven't gone after you know and i'm pretty happy i mean i got a moose in alaska was kind of my number one bucket list animal because i grew up going to alaska with their other uncle that lived up there and I got a moose in 2016 with a old um, NBA player, Evan Eschmeyer. We went up there together to bow hunt um, moose. And he got one the second to last day, and I got one that evening. So we, we were able to both tag out on big old Alaska moose. Like, I built my hunting lodge fireplace for a moose. So I had a red stag up there from New Zealand. And it's fine. The moose came. I'm like, oh, yes. My lodge wall fireplace is complete now. I can put my moose up on it. That's pretty awesome. Well, one thing I want to finish on here is, you know, we've talked about this in the past about, you know, prep school and all the benefits uh, you got from it and, and your competition and your practices and the coaching. Uh, would you have made the NBA without that, that year at MCI? I'd have to say probably not. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that year developed my basketball to a level I would have never, you know, never achieved at all. I mean, and, being in Indiana, it's like we were a small school, well, was smallish, 4A, but, uh, you know, the competition level that we would have played there is, would have been minimal. Like, I can't even think of it that year if there was a guy over 6'5", I would have played, you know, until maybe the 
somewhere in the state tournament. So the competition level and the the knowledge and the, the experience I got up there, it was a being away to college, but almost worse in terms of you're on your own. You don't have all the bougie study hall rooms, you know, the trainers, all you don't have all this stuff. It's still high school level of that, but the competition's better than most colleges you're gonna play. I mean, on a practice days, I mean I'm playing against division one players in practice every day. And then playing against other NBA players. You know, I think there that year there was I think four or five guys um, that made the NBA out of that crew that we played my senior year between me and uh, Winston and then St. Thomas Moore had um, an NBA player. I can't remember who it was. But, I mean, there was four or five NBA players. That level, I wasn't going to get in Indiana. I mean, you just don't – you don't get that type of competition unless you're in a big city, you know, especially a small town. You're not going to get it, you know, so that experience and – it gave my confidence, you know, my confidence was, you know, through the roof. I'm nervous when I get there. Then I just basketball is basketball, start playing. And it's like, oh, gosh, I just hit these guys with a pump fake and do one dribble right by them. I'm like, man, this still works. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, the experience I got there 100% made me into the pro. And I always remember Max Good's like, this guy's going to make the NBA talking about me. He's, I was like, Nice. Thank you, coach. But, you know, he's the same guy that I could call right now and I get off and we talk for an hour just about basketball. You know, that guy loves – think about him, he loved basketball. He's coaching like a Division two NAIA team or something like in Nebraska or something. You know, he just – he's like, it's never been about money. I just want to teach kids and, you know, make them a better person. Right. Well, that's great. Well, Brad, I appreciate coming on. Um, it's good chatting with you again. Good seeing you again. Yeah, yeah. I got to get you out to our property. I keep sending you pictures of all the wild out here. I know. I told you I need some more elk meat. I've been out of elk meat for a while. So it's like not about being, you know, it's not a sport, but I go, it tastes good. Mm-hmm. So the freezer's empty of elk meat. So I know, I know a place to go in Colorado. Yeah, my backyard. So. Well, folks, this was the Prep Athletics Podcast. We were had the pleasure of having 14-year NBA veteran Brad Miller join us. He's also a family member and also a member of Prep Athletics. He's part of our auxiliary staff. He's out there uh, spreading a good word about prep schools and looking for talent and hunting blinds all across the world. So, yeah. Brad, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Absolutely. Have a good one.